This Parsha podcast is dedicated in honor of my dear brother-in-law, Moshe Florence, on the occasion of his engagement to his bride, Chaya Esther Levy. We are so excited for y'all. We wish you a hearty Mazel Tov, and we wish you to have an amazing life together, a life full of happiness, of great health, of great joy, of great prosperity, and harmony. Parshas told us has a very special place in my heart. It is both my birthday Parsha and my Bar Mitzvah Parsha. I was actually born on Shabbos of Parshas Toldos 37 years ago. And my Bar Mitzvah was on Shabbos. And of course, in this week's Parsha, we have the birth of Jacob of Yaakov. My name, as you know. And we have his machinations, all the things that I like. It's a very special Parsha, but it's extra special today because there's something really special in store for you. It's year eight of the Parsha podcast. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, and we're going to, we're going to do some dad deep and deeper into the Parsha to see behind the scenes, underneath the text, what's actually happening in the background of the Parsha. But I think this week is really, it's really not deep and deeper. It's like deep and deeper and deepest. We're going to go to some very advanced esoteric places. You will find it to be very interesting. We'll have a nice callback to an episode that we did a few weeks ago. There's something really special in store for you. And I want you to tell me if I'm overselling after you hear it. And I have to tell you that a miracle happened to me today. I'm recording this on, on Wednesday. And please God will release this tonight, Wednesday evening, early Thursday morning, as we try to do every week. And I woke up this morning and I had maybe 20% of the podcast ready. And again, this is Wednesday. I have to release it tonight. And I told my wife, I'm going to the Torch Center. And I'm not leaving until there's a podcast. So I may, I may sleep here. I may have to pitch a tent over here. This is where I'm going to be until the podcast is done. And I have, um, my, uh, my pickleball partner at 430. I said to him, I don't know if I can make it. I'm not sure I'm going to make it. I cannot leave before this, this podcast is done. And I really don't have much to say. And there was a miracle, a miracle from the Almighty. He sent it my way. So what you're hearing is not what I produced, but the miracle that the Almighty sent to me in your merit. I always have to pinch myself and say, by what merit do I deserve to do this? To study the parsha each week, to do the parsha podcast with the all each week, now eight years running. I don't think it's my merit. I think it's your merit. Maybe it's the merit of my antecedents. But whatever it is, I want to also dedicate this podcast to our brothers and sisters who are in a war zone. We're still in the middle of the war, and we hope that our Torah study that we do today together will redound to their benefit. The hostages, may they return safely. The soldiers, may they return successfully and safely. May all those who are injured be healed, and may the Almighty restore peace to our nation. Regarding the war, the war did bring me out of Jewish History Podcast retirement. On Sunday, I recorded a new Jewish History Podcast for the first time in a couple of years. They pulled me out of retirement, out of my temporary hiatus. Give it a listen. I spoke about the history, the backstory, the background of the Arab-Israeli conflict. But listen to it only after you listen to the Parsha Podcast. It's really special. And I don't want you to miss it. In this podcast, we will be focusing exclusively on the beginning of the Parsha. And let's begin with segment number one. It's deep, but we'll still go a bit deeper. The birth narrative of Jacob and Asaph. I want to read the first eight verses of the Parsha with some of the Rashi commentary. And this will be our first segment. And we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper that we have done in the past, maybe the rebroadcast, but it's going to be also a nice baseline for the 
succeeding segments please God. The Parsha begins, Vela Toldos. These are the Toldos. These are the chronicles or the descendants of Isaac. Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Rashi tells us that the scoffer has said, well, Isaac is not really the son of Abraham. We have to do a genealogy test, a paternity test, because really Sarah spent the evening with Avimelech and the Almighty to thwart and foil the scoffers. He made that the visage countenance of Isaac perfectly resembled that of Abraham, no one had any doubt. Okay, the verse continues, Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel from Aram, the Aramite, from Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramite or the Aramean, and that is who he chose for a wife. Okay, so we're getting some more background. We have Isaac, son of Abraham. He looks like Abraham. He is 40 years old and he marries Rebekah, Rivka, and she's the daughter of Bethuel and the sister of Laban. And they're, they're all from this place called Padan Aram. And he's an Aramean and, and Laban's an Aramean. And we revisit the, the pedigree in the hometown of Rebekah. And again, Rashi tells us that this is presented to us, even though we know this already in the past. In last week's parasha, we read about how Eliezer was sent to go find Rebecca, and he went to Aram Naharaim, and he met these Arameans, Bethuel, Rebecca's father, Laban, Rebecca's brother. We know this information already. But it's revisited over here to tell us her praise, even though her father was a sinner, and her brother was a sinner, and was wicked in her whole, her whole hometown. It's just a cesspool of wickedness. Nevertheless, she remained pure. Okay? So we meet the primary characters, Isaac, his pedigree, Rebecca, and hers. And then we read verse 3. Isaac was praying to Hashem opposite his wife, for she was infertile. She was barren. And God heeded him, and Rebecca became pregnant. The third verse of our parsha tells us that these people, Isaac and Rebecca, they're married, but they're not having any children. As we shall see later on, it was 20 years from when they got married until their children were born. Isaac was 40 when they got married, and Isaac was 60, 20 years later, when Jacob and Esau were born. So she's barren for a very long time. And what do we do in such a situation? Isaac prays opposite his wife. And God listens. And Rebecca became pregnant. Now, there are many words in the Torah that are used for prayer. We've said in the past many times that there are 10 languages, 10 verbs of prayer. Because each one is a bit different and it's a bit nuanced. And we're like the Eskimos. The Eskimos have lots of words for snow because their their whole life is really about snow. They live in the snow and the igloos and everywhere they see is snow. So they could tell the difference between the subtleties of the different sleets and the sloshy snow and the powdery snow. I'm just making this up. And, and the icy snow. And therefore, they could tell the differences. We are experts in prayer. It's a central component of our religious life. It's one of the pillars upon which the world stands. Our nation is really dedicated to the craft and the art of prayer. And therefore, there are a lot of different words, 10 different words, that are used for prayer because every prayer is a bit different. Now, this word for prayer that is featured in the third verse of our parsha, it's a very unusual word. Vayetar Yitzchak. So what does this mean? It doesn't say Vayitzbalel or Vayifga. There are a lot of words and it uses this one in particular. So Rashi tells us that this word, vayetar, which is the word for prayer, it's a certain type of prayer. It refers to a certain profuse and incessant prayer. He didn't just pray, pray and and leave. He prayed and he pestered and he continued and he didn't stop. It was incessant. It was continuous. Okay. And then it says, Lenochach Ishto, opposite his wife. So Rashi tells us again, very interesting. They prayed opposite each other. Isaac prayed in one corner. And Rebecca prayed in another corner. 
And then the verse tells us, the verse wraps up, Vayaser lo, and God hearkened to him. And Rashi tells us, to him and not to her, because his prayer was more powerful than her prayer, because he was a righteous person, the son of a righteous person, whereas she was a righteous person, the son of a wicked person. And therefore, the verse says, God listened to him and not to her. Okay, so a few observations. This is, again, though, this is the warm-up segment. The warm-up segment. It's deep, but it's just the beginning. Rashi tells us that when the verse says they prayed opposite each other, it means that he prayed in one corner and she prayed in another corner. So this got my attention. What is this idea of praying in corners? Specifically, him in one corner and her in the other. Of course, when I had such a question, I texted my brother-in-law, Shmuley, Shmuley Botnik, and he suggested something to me. He said maybe it has something to do with sacrifices. We know that Isaac, he was a sacrifice by the binding of Isaac. And his greatness was that of avoda, the, the idea of service to God. And the Talmud equates Isaac with the parochist, with the curtain. So maybe Isaac's prayer, which again, we have a very unusual word for it, vayyaser, it's a very unusual word to describe prayer. His prayer was a form of a sacrifice. And we know part of the process of sacrifices is to to process the blood of a sacrifice on the corners of the altar. So what Shmuley su- suggested, what he speculated, is that maybe this idea that Rashi tells us that he's praying in one corner and she's praying in the other corner, that has something to do with a version of, of sacrifices. Okay, that's what, what he thought. What struck me is that there's a description in the Talmud about the prayer of Rabbi Akiva. In the book of Brachos, on page 31a, the Talmud tells us that when Rabbi Akiva would pray, it depends. When he was praying with the public, everyone's praying together. So, of course, no one would conclude their prayer before Rabbi Akiva does. The 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 Chazar Sashats, the Repetition of the chazan after everyone's prayer would only begin after Rabbi Kiva finished his prayer. So he would pray very quickly to not cause a pain for everyone to have to wait for him. You imagine if the great rabbi prays for three hours, everyone sits around and just waits for them to finish, it causes a disruption to the public. So in order to minimize the disruption to the public, the Tircha de Tzibura, he prayed very quickly. However, when he was praying alone, this is what the Talmud says. You would leave him in one corner and he would pray and end up in the opposite corner. The Talmud says that his prayer was so intense and it was so alive and he was always bowing and and prostrating himself and genuflecting to God. And it was so intense, if you started off, and he was in one corner of the room, by the time he was finished his prayer, he was on the other end of the room in the other corner. This, to me, maybe is not a coincidence. I, I looked to see if anyone makes the connection between the prayer of Isaac and Rebecca, each in their own corner. And Rabbi Kiva, the Talmud, tells us that he prayed from one corner to the other. It seems to me, again, this is, we're just getting warmed up here. It seems to me that there's a form of prayer in corner A and a form of prayer in corner B. There's a prayer of Isaac and there's a prayer, a prayer of Rebecca. Each one is in its own corner. And somehow Rabbi Akiva was able to incorporate both the prayer of Isaac and the prayer of Rebecca. He prayed in both corners. There's a secret here. We're going to put a collective pin in it because, again, we're just, we're just getting warmed up. We're going a little bit deeper, but it's okay if we don't understand everything the first go round. Now, there's another observation here in this verse. The verse says that Isaac prayed, and again, the the word that he uses, vayetari yitzchak, it's a very unusual word for prayer. And Rashi, of course, says it's an incessant prayer. But the Midrash observes that when the verse says that God hearkened to Isaac's prayer, 
It says, Vayeaser lo Hashem, which is the same word, Vayeatar and Vayeaser lo Hashem. It's the same letters in Hebrew. So it's an unusual word for prayer, but it's the same unusual word for hearkening the prayer. And the Midrash says something unbelievable. The Midrash says that this word, Vayeatar and Vayeaser, it comes from the word that means digging, like digging a tunnel. Isaac and Rebecca had a problem. There was infertility. And by the way, the commentaries tell us that it wasn't just infertility on one end, both he and her were infertile. They had a problem. They wanted something, but there was almost an impenetrable wall an impregnable wall between them and what they wanted. So what do you do when you're in a situation and you need to get through and there's a wall that you cannot possibly get through? Isaac and Rebecca found another way in. Vayetar Yitzchak. He prayed, but again, the word also means to dig. He started digging beneath the walls. He started tunneling his way in. Now, God hearkened the prayer. And the the word that it uses to describe God listening to Isaac and Rebecca's prayer, Isaac really specifically, the altar low, God listened to him in particular. It's the same word. It says in the Midrash, God also contributed. God, while Isaac was tunneling from one side of the wall, God was tunneling from the other side. And they met in the middle. And the Midrash offers an analogy of a prince. The prince wants to get into the treasure house of the king. He wants to get some of the treasures of the king. But you try to break into Fort Knox, you can't do it. There's no way to enter. It's impregnable. How are you going to get through the defenses if you go head on? So the prince decides, I'm not going to go through this wall. You can't do it. I'm going to tunnel my way in. Now the king, the king wants his son to have the gold. So he works in tunneling towards him from the opposite direction and thus easing his efforts. To me, this was a, an amazing description of prayer. There are a lot of different words that you could use for prayer. And the particular word that's used over here is a word that also means to tunnel. It seems to me that there is a sort of prayer that is reserved, that is dedicated for absolutely impossible circumstances. The walls are locked, are formidable, are impenetrable. There's no natural way in. Of course, prayer, we need for everything. We, we pray every day just for the basics. And even the things that we hope we could get in a more natural way, it makes sense for us to get. It's not a violation of the rules of physics or nature for us to get it. We still pray for that. And that's a normal prayer. This is a special prayer, a prayer dedicated for impossible tasks. Isaac is infertile. Rebecca is infertile. Naturally, biologically, there's no way for them to get what they want. There's a wall. The wall is stopping them. But there's a type of prayer for that situation as well. And that's the type of prayer that Isaac deployed. The tunneling prayer. It's impossible. Yes. But God is also tunneling, so to speak, from the other side. What a beautiful idea. I think it's particularly apt for our times. You think about our brothers and sisters in Gaza. And there's a lot of tunnels there as well. And they're trying to clear out the tunnels in Gaza. And the place is swarming with terrorists. And it's all booby-trapped, and there's all sorts of 
difficulties that really make it an impossible task. I think it's very appropriate for us to know that there's a sort of prayer, there's a type of prayer, there's a mode of prayer that's dedicated for the impossible. It's impossible. You can't do it. Well, we'll try it nonetheless. We have a direct channel to God and there's a form of entreatment of God for impossible situations. And when we do that, when we rely on God to help us out of a situation that's impossible, he starts tunneling in our direction. What a beautiful idea. That is the form of prayer of Isaac. Continues the verse, she becomes pregnant. But it's not the idyllic pregnancy that everyone dreams of. The kids are fighting within her. And she says, if so, lama ze anochi, why am I? And she went to inquire. By God, she went to speak to the prophet. So there's a lot to unpack over here. The kids are scuffling, they're struggling, they're running within her. And she says something. She says, if so, why is this I? It's a very mysterious formulation. Vatomer, and she said, Im kein, if so, lama ze anochi, why is anochi, I? And she went to ask God, she went to inquire by the prophet. And Rashi, of course, tells us very famously that when she passed by the halls of study of Shem and Aver, then Jacob, who was one of the babies within her, he stirred and he wanted to go out. When she passed by the entrances for the halls of idolatry, well, then Asav was aroused to leave. And that's the struggle that's within her. And then she says, why is this I, why was I praying so much for this pregnancy when it's so painful, it's so difficult, it's so problematic? And she went to the prophet. And the prophet tells her, Shnei goyim bivitneich. There are two nations within you. And two kingdoms from your innards will go their opposite ways. And one nation will rule, will overpower the other nation. And ultimately, the older one will be submitted to the younger one. This is a very uh, loaded prophecy. And Rashi gets us into the whole discussion here. Rashi tells us, first, Rashi notices something unbelievable. Uh, the verse says, Shnei goyim bevitnech. There are two nations within you. The word goy means nation. Goyim is nations. There are two nations within Rebecca. But Rashi notes that in the Torah scroll, it doesn't say goyim, gimel vav yud mem. It says geyim. Gimel, Yud, Yud, Mem. The word Geim means proud ones. So the word is pronounced as Goyim, nations, but the word is spelled as Geim, proud ones. So both of them have to be true. Whenever the Torah has a word that's spelled one way and pronounced a different way, it means that both of those words, the way it's spelled and the way it's pronounced, are both part of the message. So, of course, the message of Goyim, there are two nations within you, Jacob will found a nation, Esav will found a nation as well. But there's another layer. Shnei Goyim bevitnech, there are two proud ones within you, says Rashi. This is a reference to the heirs of Jacob and Esav. Elu Antoninus Verebi. This is a reference to a pair of people, of leaders of their respective nations, that will happen you know, 15, 1700 years later. Rabbi Judah the Prince will be the leader of the Jews, and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus will be the leader of the Romans. The Rome, of course, is going to be the nation of Asaph. And when the prophet tells her there are two proud ones within you, he's hinting to the future descendants of Jacob and Esau, namely Rabbi Judah the Prince from Jacob and 
Marcus Aurelius Antoninus from the nation of Asaph. Now, this is a very unusual Rashi. Rebecca is having a difficult pregnancy. She has some morning sickness. And she goes to the prophet. And she says, well, why is this I? And the prophet says, oh, in, in 1700 years, the two people that are within you, the two children, the two embryos, the two babies that are within you, will have descendants named Rabbi Judah the Prince and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, will be the, the emperor of the Roman Empire. And that's somehow going to be comforting for her right now. Very, very interesting. Now, just some background. Rabbi Judah the Prince and Antoninus, they have a very collaborative relationship. The Talmud tells us that there were tunnels connecting their two palaces. Rabbi Judah the Prince, the president of the Jewish people, also the architect of the Mishnah, one of the most important, significant personalities in our history. And the Roman emperor, Antoninus, he had a palace in, in Caesarea. And there was a tunnel connecting these two palaces. And every day, Antoninus would travel along this tunnel, emerge in the house of Rabbi Judah the Prince, and they would study Torah together. And the Talmud tells us that Marcus Aurelius Antoninus surreptitiously converted and became righteous. And when Rabbi Judah the Prince, when he wanted to organize the convention, the 20-year convention to codify the Mishnah, he had the support and the political cover from the Romans because he was best buds with Antoninus. So there is a certain degree of comfort that the prophet is telling her that in the future, even though they're fighting now, in the future they will be collaborative. But it's still a very interesting comment in Rashi. Finally, we have the rest of the narrative. At the end of her term, there are twins. Another amazing Rashi. Rashi notes that the word te'omim, which means twins, typically is spelled with an aleph, a tough aleph, vav, mem, maybe even a yud, and then another mem. And here it says tomim. It's, it's spelled missing some letters. Whereas by Tamar, Judah and Tamar, later on in the Torah, later on in Genesis, we read about Judah and his daughter-in-law, and they bore twins as well. There it's spelled a little bit, a little bit differently with all the letters in place. Here it's spelled missing some letters, and that is here to teach us that because Asaph is not going to be righteous, it's not appropriate to spell the word that is referring to the twins within Rebecca with all the letters because there's something missing, something missing, so to speak. Whereas in the episode of Tamar and Judah, their twins are both righteous, therefore the word Te'omim is spelled with all the letters. Okay. Asaph is born, the verse says. The first one came out. He is ruddy. He's red, completely like a cloak of hair. And he's called Asaph. He's ruddy, Rashi tells us. That's a sign that he'll be a murderer. And he's completely like a cloak of hair. He is full of hair. Rashi tells us, like a garment made out of wool that's full of hair. And the last verse that we are going to address is the birth of Jacob. Afterwards, his brother comes out and his hand is clutching on the heels of Esau. And he's called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. And again, there's another amazing set of comments here in Rashi. Rashi says that Jacob was really on one dimension also the firstborn. He gives the analogy of a cylinder. If you have a cylinder, you put in two rocks in it. So you put in rock number one and the rock number two. Now you want to empty out the cylinder. Which rock comes out first? The rock that you put in second comes out first. Jacob was really the firstborn. He went in first. He was conceived first. And the next one was Asaph. But because Asaph went in last, first in, last out, second in, last in, first out, Asaph was really, on one dimension, younger. Okay, interesting. 
And Jacob is clutching onto the heels of Esav. That is a sign Rashi tells us that Esav will not finish his journey before Jacob comes and grabs it from him. The end of a journey is called the heel. That's why the time before the Messiah, that's called the Ikvasad Meshicha, the heel of Messiah. Okay, that's segment number one. We have the introduction, the birth narrative of Jacob and Esav. Rebecca, we have the prayer, the tunnel prayer, of course, the very deep t- the kind of prayer where you're burrowing under an impenetrable wall. We have the difficult pregnancy. She goes to the prophet. The prophet tells her there are two proud ones within you. That's Rabbi Judah the Prince and Marcus Israelis and Antoninus. And we have the birth of initially Esav and then Jacob. Let's get to sediment number two. Let's go a bit deeper here. We have the background. We're all warmed up. Let's dig in a bit deeper. Let's start with the birth of Esav. The verse says, Vayetze harishon. The first one came out. He was admoni. He was ruddy. He was red. Kulo ka'aderes se'aris. Completely like a cloak of hair. And his name was Esav. This is 25.25 of Genesis. What does this mean? So Rashi says, he was ke'aderes se'ar. He was full of hair like a talus, like a garment of wool that is full of hair. You read this Rashi, and Rashi seems to be belaboring a certain point. The verse is telling us that you know, most kids are born with very little hair. Some, you know, have a little hair on their head. Some even have some peach fuzz. It's very rare. I don't know, does it even happen? A child's born with a full beard? And chest hair? And back hair? And underarm hair? Hair all over, all over their body? That is very rare. When Asa was born, he was covered in hair. Like a garment of wool that's full of hair. There's no spot that has no hair. Kabbalistically, we're told that this is a symbol that everything gets caught up. If something's very hairy, everything gets caught up in it. Or if something's, if something's smooth, it could just, it could just roll off of it. Asaph is someone, he's gonna, he's gonna do all the sins and everything's gonna get caught up in him. That's what the Kabbalists say. But, we're not quite there. We don't know what that even means. But I did notice something unbelievable. When I was studying with my study partner on Sunday, it hit me. Rashi doesn't just say that he was full of hair. Rashi says he was full of hair, like a garment made of wool that's full of hair. Asav is hairy, okay, but he's like a cloak of wool. Wool. What is the Torah significance of wool? And then I remembered that this is not the only fabric that Asaph is compared to. In chapter 37, so this is we're up to chapter 25, in a couple of weeks we'll read Parshas Vayeshev. And the very first verse of Parshas Vayeshev, chapter 37, verse 1, it says, Vayeshev Yaakov, and Jacob dwelled in the land of the dwelling place of his father, in the land of Canaan. After he spent 20 years with Laban, traveled back, he met Esau along the way. Now he's finally settled in the land of Canaan. Now, the chapter that immediately precedes this one, so chapter 36, the very last chapter in Parshas Vayishlach, the chapter is dedicated to the long and detailed genealogy of all the chieftains of Esav. And right away it says that Vayeshev Yaakov, Yaakov dwelled, Jacob dwelled in the land of Canaan. And it tells us about his son, Joseph. So Rashi, in his comment, he provides us an analogy of the flax dealer and the blacksmith and the spark and the wise men. Rashi says, that there was a flax dealer who had camels 
laden with flax. And the blacksmith was wondering, how is all this flax going to enter? So the wise man said, if you just take your hammer and hit your anvil, and you have one spark that comes out of the hammer striking the anvil, that will consume and engulf all the flax. Okay, that's the analogy. What's the lesson? Jacob witnessed the massive empire of Asaph. Chapter 36, it lists chieftain after chieftain, all these very impressive leaders that emanated from Asaph. And Jacob, he sees that and he says, how can I possibly conquer all of this? And then the verse says that Jacob dwelled in the land of Canaan and he had a son named Joseph. The house of Jacob is like a fire and the house of Joseph is like a spark. And the house of Esau, that is like straw. One spark comes out of Joseph and that will consume and engulf all of the flats of Asaph. In this analogy, Jacob is the blacksmith. Asaph, he's the flats dealer with all the camels bearing flats. And Joseph, that's the spark that is emitted from the anvil of the blacksmith that will engulf the paper tiger, the flats of Asaph. Now, I've got, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on over here. A lot of different moving parts. Very interesting comment. But for our purposes, Rashi compares Asaph to flax. Flax, that is the material that used to make linen. So Asaph is compared to, he's very hairy. Adara says, he's very hairy, like a wool garment. And that's in 25 25. 37.1, Rashi tells us, He's like flax. He's like linen. Wool and linen. Wool and flax. There is a prohibition in the Torah that appears in two places. Leviticus 19, Devarim 22. Not to wear a garment woven of these two fabrics. You could wear a wool garment. You could wear a linen garment. You cannot wear a garment that's partially wool and partially linen. Esav is Shatnes. Shatnes is the name, the Torah name for this kind of fabric. That was my observation on Sunday. I have to say this is one of my favorite observations. It's a Parsha podcast special. Esav is compared to two fabrics, wool and linen. And again, Rashi in both places He's telling us an interpretation, and he just throws in, oh, Asaph is like wool. He, he's, he's really hairy, like like a garment of wool. That's over here, 25-25. And then 37-1, he doesn't just say, well, Joseph will consume and destroy Asaph. He first tells us that Asaph is like camels. He's like a flax dealer with, with camels full of flax. Asaph is flax and linen. He is shotness. Now, the big question, of course, is what do you do with such an observation? What, what is the lesson for us? So I had a few ideas, but I think there's probably more ways you can go with it. The first idea, maybe the first angle of investigation, is that we know there are two instances when shotness is permitted if you wear tzitzis, tzitzis, the mitzvah to wear strings, fringes on the corners of your four-cornered garments, if that garment has shatness, it is permitted to wear. Thus, it's hinted in the verse, but it says it explicitly in the Talmud. In addition, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and according to some, also the ordinary Kohen, they are allowed to wear shotness because some of the garments of the priesthood are, in fact, made out of shotness. What this tells me is that the essence of Esav, shotness, 
There are foils for Esav. And one foil is the tzitzis. And the other foil is the calling God of the high priest, and maybe even the ordinary priest, doing work in the temple. And I think there's some ways to go with this. I, I had an idea, just one way of how to interpret this. The, the verse tells us when you wear tzitzis, you're supposed to remember God. And then not deviate after your eyes and after your heart, etc. That's the verse in Numbers 15. Asav has a very, very, very good memory. In our parsha, after Jacob usurps the blessings from Asaph, Asaph vows to kill him. And that's why Jacob has to flee. And it's 30, almost 35 years later. They meet again, and Asaph is still piping mad. He still has the fire of vengeance from the crime of 35 years prior. It seems like Esav, one of the flaws of Esav, is that his memory is so sharp, but for evil, for vengeance, for bloodlust. And the opposite of that is Sitsis, where we, we, we remember and never forget God. And we never forget his mitzvahs. And the, the, the passion and the love and the intensity of the connection that we had to God at Sinai that is preserved via the Tzitzis. So Tzitzis are the eternal memory of goodness, and that perhaps is the foil for Asa, which is the eternal memory of evil. Again, only one angle of investigation. Another angle of investigation. If Asa is Shatnes, well, Shatnes is, is unique in that it is a mixture of two things, wool and linen, and each one alone is okay, wool is fine, linen is fine, it's only the mixture that's a problem. Now, the mitzvah tells us that the spiritual origin of the prohibition of shatness comes from the offerings of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, of course, chapter 4 of Genesis, they each brought an offering to God from their bounty. Cain was a farmer. Abel was a shepherd. And each brought from their bounty. What did Cain bring? So the verse doesn't really tell us. But the Midrash says he brought flax. And what did Abel bring? He brought unshorn sheep. Cain brought linen. Abel brought wool. Says the Midrash, this is why shotness, the mixture of wool and linen, is prohibited. You cannot mix the offering of the sinner, i.e. the offering of Cain, with the offering of the righteous one with the offering of Abel, and therefore it is prohibited. Esav, he embodies this mixture. He has some good and some evil, and it's so deeply intertwined, it's interwoven, that that is way worse. Wool on its own is fine, linen on its own is fine, but the mixture of the two, the binding, the tapestry of the two, that's the ultimate evil. Now, a few years ago, we had another Parsha podcast special where we observed that Esav is compared to two animals. He's compared to two fabrics, but also to two animals. 2530, when Jacob secures the birthright, the verse says that Esav said to Jacob, Halitainina, feed me please from this red, red, red stuff. And Rashi notes that this is an unusual word for feed me. Rashi explains that this is the type of feeding that you do when the person opens their mouth and the other person pours it down their mouth. And then Rashi, ad- and then Rashi adds, this is what the Mishnah says, that when you feed a camel, mal eaten oso, you feed it in this manner. 
when Esav asked to eat, he asked to be fed like a camel is fed. And by the way, you remember the, the flax dealer who had all this flax and, and the blacksmith was told just one little spark from the hammer on the anvil will destroy all the flax. What, what was carrying the flax? Rashi 37, one tells us camels, not a coincidence. Asaph is a camel. Now, a camel, it's a very unusual animal from a Torah perspective because the camel has one kosher sign, but not the other. It does, in fact, chew its cud, but it does not have split hooves. And thus it's appropriate for Asaph, who is this mixture of good and evil, who is the wool and linen together, it's appropriate for him to be compared to a camel. Now, there's another animal that Asaph is compared to. 2634. The verse says that Asaph was 40 years old when he married his two wives, Yehudit and Basmas. Who else got married when they were 40? So, of course, the beginning of the Parsha tells us that Isaac married Rebekah when he was 40. It says Rashi, 2634, Asaph was like a pig. A pig. It's not a kosher animal, but it does have split hooves. And when a pig lies down, it extends its front legs in front of it to show, to purport to be kosher. Look, I'm kosher. Look, I have split hooves. Asaph is like a pig. His whole life is a whole long career of crime. For 40 years, he's kidnapping women, and he's raping women, and he's committing adultery with women. And then he turns 40, and he says, oh, I'm 40. Well, I'm like Isaac. Isaac was 40 when he got married. I'm going to get married at 40 as well. And thus, Isaac got married at 40, and and Esau, like a pig, trying to brandish its sign of righteousness, holiness, and being kosher, he got married at 40 as well. And again, a pig, very unusual animal from a Torah perspective, because it has one kosher sign. It does, in fact, have split hooves, but it doesn't have the other. He's compared to a pig. He's compared to a camel. He is shot in his. That is what Asaph is all about. And that's what makes him so dangerous. Asaph is not someone who is a complete wicked entity with no redeeming qualities. He does have a foothold in holiness. But enmeshed in that, mixed and woven into that, is impurity. Again, if you have linen on its own, it's fine. Wool on its own is fine. It's only if you take the linen of Cain and you empower it and you amplify it with the wool of Abel, only then when you have amplified impurity, that is very dangerous. Obviously, this is very deep. We'll call it, we'll call it deeper. But there are yet more layers to go. And let's get to segment number three. This one comes courtesy of one of the great works of, Kab- of Kabbalah, the Megala Amukos, which literally means the Megala, which means the revealer of Amukos, of the depths. There's a book written by one of the great Kabbalists. He lived in the late 16th century. His name was Rabnasan Nata Shapira. And his work, the Mangala, because we, we've quoted it a few times on the Parsh podcast, it's one of the great works of, of Kabbalah. I will tell you, his last name was Shapira, or Shapiro. My mother's maiden name is, is Spira, which is Shapira. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, he was the son of 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 this author of the Megala Mukros, 12 generations. So, you know, our theme this year on the Parsha podcast is dad. This, this segment, it's dad in more than one sense of the word. It's kind of my, my great grandfather, a blessed memory, 14 generations back and I think it would qualify as not just deep and deeper, it's it's the deepest. Listen to this. 
What happened the first time that Rebecca met Isaac? In last week's parish show, we had the very long narrative of Eliezer going to Aram Naharayim, taking the camels and negotiating with Laban, with, with Bethuel, and going to the well and making that prayer, the right one, she should give me water, but also to my camels. Finally, Eliezer is heading back. And the verse tells us, chapter 24, verse 64, Rebecca lifted her eyes and she saw Isaac. Vatipol me'al hagamol. And she fell off the camel. She saw Isaac, and it must have been a very impressive sight. And she fell off the camel. And the Torah tells us that. Isn't that interesting? For us, we would say that's a, a trivial anecdote. Why does it have to be in the Torah? What is the significance of this factoid? that Rebecca fell off the camel when she saw Isaac. What's it telling us? It seems so unnecessary. What does a camel symbolize spiritually? We just said, a camel's a mixture. It's a mixture of kosher and non-kosher. It has one sign but not the other. Asaph is a camel. That's why he's a problem. What is the first instance of the idea of a mixture of good and bad. That, of course, is the tree of knowledge. Eitz hadas, the tree of knowledge, tov vara, good and evil. The original sin of Adam and Eve was the imbibing of the mixture. That sin is akin to the camel. The Midrash actually tells us I'll tell you something you didn't know yet. I'll be very surprised if you did know this. The Midrash says that the serpent, the primordial serpent who enticed Adam and Eve, he was the size of a camel. And on top of this camel was an angel, the one that we're not allowed to pronounce his name, Samach Mem Aleph Lamed, We call him Uncle Sam here. This serpent was really, or it was like a camel, it was the size of a camel, and on top of it was riding this angel, Samach Mem, Samach Mem Al Flamed. So a camel is a mixture of good and and evil. And here's the the callback. Remember a few weeks ago, Parshas Noach, we spoke about the dimensions of the ark. And we spoke about how Samach Mem. That's the sign, that's the impurity, that's the poison, that's the venom of this angel. But the Aleph Lame, that's the name of God, and that is the, the, the one and the thirty, that is the antidote, so to speak, to said angel. So we have this camel, who is a mix of good and bad, and we have the angel, which is, which is also good and evil interwoven. And Rebecca, she's riding a camel. The camel the symbol of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. The camel that symbolizes the sin of Adam and Eve. It symbolizes the the confusion and the mixed nature of humanity ever since that sin. What was the primary result of the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge? The verse tells us, death. On the day that you eat from the tree, you will be condemned to die. The Hebrew word for camel is gamal, gimel mem lamid. That is an acronym for garam misal olam, caused death to the world. This camel, which symbolizes this sin, that caused death, that condemned the world to die. So obviously this is a much deeper reading of the Torah. Esav, he says, haliteni, feed me. In this very unusual, it doesn't say haachileni, feed me. It says haliteni, Feed me like a camel. And he is compared to carrying flax on a camel. And Rebecca, she falls off of the camel. And there's more. There's a well-known precept 
in the Kabbalistic literature that Isaac and Rebecca, they emanate spiritually from Adam and Eve. A reincarnation of Adam is Isaac. A reincarnation of Eve is Rebecca. And they came back with a mandate to fix the flaws of the two forebears. Adam and Eve, they also gave birth to twins, Cain and Abel, one good and one wicked. They sinned with the tree of knowledge, good and bad, with a camel, and the camel is still very, very strong within them. The first time that Isaac and Rebekah met, Rebekah fell off the camel. She's slipping off the camel. She's divesting the camel. She's removing the camel. She's smoking it. She's trying to eliminate this notion of the camel, the mixture of good and bad. She's trying to shed it. She's trying to remove it. And at least that's what she tried to do. That's what she thought she was doing. 20 years later, she's pregnant with twins. And whenever she passes a house of scholarship, Jacob wants to go out. And when she passes the idolatry, Asa wants to go out. Jacob is totally good. Asa is totally bad. It's a redux. We've met Cain and Abel once again. There's this tussling of these children within her. And that tells her, oh no, I tried to get rid of the camel. I tried to slip off the camel. But the camel's still here. We still have this mixture of good and bad. She thought there was progress. And now she's realizing that there has been no progress in her efforts. She's back to square square one. And what does she say? Why am I? For what am I? I've done nothing. I've improved nothing. The only reason why I exist is to fix the sin of Eve. Why am I here? I haven't made any progress. I'm still squarely on the camel that I thought we smoked. And she went to inquire with the prophet. And he comforts her. There are two nations within you. It doesn't say goyim nations. It says gayim, proud ones. And that's Rabbi Judah and... Antoninus. And again, we were wondering, like, wondering well, why is that pertinent over here? Well, why does that, why is that salient now? Why is that germane to her now? And she's appeased. She was worried that she was still squarely on the camel. There was 100% good with 0% evil and 100% bad with zero good. There's no progress. And the prophet reveals to her, no, 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 you did make some progress. Jacob and Asaph, they will be embodied by Rabbi Judah the Prince and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And he's going to be righteous. And he's going to repent. And he's going to help Rabbi Judah the Prince in the sacred effort of writing down the Mishnah. Even Asaph. You think Asaph is just bad. He's just a reincarnation of Cain. Even Asaph is not pure evil. There's a little spark of righteousness within him. And that spark of righteousness will be fanned to life in Antoninus. Within you, the prophet tells her, there is Antoninus. Even though Asaph is totally wicked, it's not totally wicked. It's not full camel. There's a little spark, a little dose, a little modicum of righteousness within him. Antoninus is within him still. And she's comforted. The camel. It's been a little bit distanced from her. She did accomplish something. Some work had been done in smoking the camel. And yes, it won't be manifested for many centuries. But the mere knowledge that some progress had been made, that was sufficient to provide her with a modicum of comfort. Wow, what an insight. Thus concludes segment number three, deep, deeper, and deepest. I have nothing to say but the fact that 
How fortunate are we? How lucky are we that we get to enjoy such a rich and delightful experience together here on the Parsha Podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. We have some nice ideas to take away with us. The tunnel prayer. I love that one. Isaac faced an impossible task. It was not possible. And he found the form of prayer. There's a mode of prayer. The boring company prayer. Dig under. And when you do, God will dig in the opposite direction, so to speak. We see all these citations, all these sources describing Esau in all these interesting ways. He's a camel. He's a pig. He is wool and linen. He's shotness. That's what it is revealing to us about him. And we see the whole camel theme. And Rebecca, and she's worried about it. What's going to be? I tried to get rid of the camel. But the small progress in the sacred effort to eliminate the camel, so to speak, of the sin of Adam and Eve, that provided her comfort. I started off the podcast by saying, well, this is going to be a special one. Was it? Did I live up to the billing? Was it worth the price of admission? Let me know. Send me an email. Rabbi, wallbeachman.com. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I appreciate your listenership. I hope you have a wonderful day, a splendid rest of your week. I hope to only hear good news from our brethren in the land of Israel. Have an incredible Shabbos upcoming. How fortunate are we to have the Almighty Shabbos? It's a gift that he gave us. How fortunate, how lucky are we that we have the Almighty's Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, and again, this week, I got a lot of help. Every week, we get a lot of help. Every time we breathe, it's a gift from God. But this week, in particular, I I woke up this morning, again, with 20%, 20% of the podcast done, and now it's uh, not yet two in the afternoon, and we're wrapping up the podcast. Thank you, Hashem, for giving us this wonderful Torah and this wonderful Parsha podcast. And please, God, with help of the we will continue to study on the Parsha podcast, on year eight of the Parsha podcast. Please, God, next week.